I'm going to introduce our second speaker, uh, Winnie Ying, who um, is no stranger to most of the people in this room, but I will give you a very quick summary of her background. As you know, she is the CAW Sam Gindon Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University. And Winnie's uh, ongoing commitment to broad alliances across different sectors and sites of social justice inform her research interest in anti-racism, equality, coalition, and capacity building. She has a wealth of experience in the Calendrian labor movement and has won numerous awards, including the United Farm Workers Cesar Chavez Black Eagle Award. She is a much sought after speaker and contributor to women's rights, labor equity, and anti-racism -racis issues. Winnie's presentation tonight will focus on the race, gender, and class organization uh, co organizing within the Canadian labor movement. Please welcome Winnie to. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I guess following from what Steve had said. Um, my presentation tonight take more the long view. There are going to be there are going to be a Ford, Hudak, Harpers anytime, all the time. Part of this whole process then is how do we organize? How can we organize from the ground up and create a truly interracial working class movement for the long haul? So I just, I just want to begin by saying I came to Canada from Hong Kong in 1968 and then uh, as an international student and became a union organizer with the International Ladies' Government Workers' Union in 1977. Um, since then, the labor movement has been my site of um, activism. And so tonight's comment will center on the po both the possibility and the challenge of race, gender, and class organizing in the labor movement. And I will particularly speak to three points. First is on the compartmentalizations of race, class, and gender within the left. Second is, within our labor movement, the over-reliance on a legislative collective bargaining model. And thirdly is, how do we envision, rather than a movement, a social, a labor movement, it's can we re-envision re a social movement of labor. So, and I'm hoping that after the, after the presentations from the three of us, we can have a courageous conversations on what needs to take place from here on end. Um, from organizing garment workers, restaurant workers, hotel workers, to working with the former <coughs> PMP, the progressive mode of products workers whose plant file for bankruptcy protections or in, in a sudden and then reducing 2,400 predominantly immigrant workers, reducing them jobless and owing over 30 millions in severance and termination pay. For me, through all these organizing, there's nothing more inspiring when we hear a worker, a union member, who starts switching from saying I to saying we. And that's when we know we have an activist for life, hopefully. Organizing is about building relationship, building commitment, and integrating both the head, hands, feet, and mostly the heart. It's through relationship building that workers recognize their power if they stick together. It's less about rhetoric, ideologies, but more about building and being there when it counts. For many of these workers who are racialized and my immigrant workers, there's an unspoken affinity based on the shared experience of migration, racism, and exploitation. And here I'm not trying to portray that all immigrant workers as, and all racialized workers as quote unquote noble, noble <laughs> migrants. <laughs> 
But however, there's a sense of that resistance of constantly being put down, being treated as a second class citizens. And that, to me, that's the process that radicalized a lot of these immigrant workers, uh, working class identity. Because be it in signing a union card, mobilizing for a vote in the workplace, risk being fired to continue the organizing, and holding job action in the hotel lobby, or occupying at the plant gate 24-7 for 16 days like the PMP workers, these are the workers that are changing the narrative of the dominant class, reclaiming the space and breaking, uh, breaking the typecast of being seen as passive, conservative, and in a lot of incidences, dispelling the myth commonly held by unions that immigrant workers are unorganizable. In Toronto, I don't know whether how many of you are aware that in Toronto, Toronto is the only city in North America where up until recently, all three Chinese daily newspapers are unionized under uniform. Right? Um, all the, the staff of the Chinese nursing homes in Toronto, both Yi Hong and Mang Shang, or 800 of them are unionized under SCIU. And that the workers of Wang Noodles, Fortune Cookies, <coughs> members of the UFCW, went on strike for over eight, eight weeks for their collective bargaining, for the second round of contracts. I think that those are the pieces that is not brought up to the front as much as we would like to. And to me, for the racializations of these workers, once they landed in Canada, had provided the, to me, the spark and also the rallying points where people organize. In these experiences, my position is class, race, and gender are inseparable. And here I draw on the, the writing and theorizing of Himani Banerjee in her article that provides such clarity. And I'm going to quote one paragraph, one, uh, the following quote, so bear with me. The social experiences is not as lived a matter of intersectionality. Their sense of being in the world texturized through myriad, myriad of social relations and cultural forms is lived or perceived or felt as being all together and all at once. A working class non-white woman's presence in the usual racialized environment is not divisible separately or serially. The fact of her blackness, her sex and gender neutral personhood of being working class blend into something of an identity simultaneously and instantaneously. The identification is both in the eyes of the beholder and her own sense of social presence captured by the great gaze. So in that sense, it, to me, I think it's beyond intersectionality, if I could put it forward. Um, and it's not to separate class from the cultural and social relations of race, gender, patriarchy. And above all, it's also recognizing that race, gender is part of the process and manifestations of slavery, colonialism, and imperialism. And that in that sense, through that process, an ideology of class that transformed and also was transformed by race. So race in that sense, race and gender are part of the working class consciousness. And I think it's very often within the progressive left movement, the labor movement, race is often relegated as identity politics. Race is seen as a distraction and diversion from the focus of what the real organizing that should be on class. And, and I think in that sense, in the context of race, race is often associated with um, rights and citizenship. And within the academy, uh, race often is seen less of a scholarship and more seen as activism. 
in the labor movement, we also see, you know, and here a lot of times is race and gender. Um, aside from being a distraction and diversion, and <laughs> and sometimes like now it's for pragmatic reasons, it's seen as an organizing tool, organizing strategy to increase union membership because you can't ignore the diversity and the, uh, the diverse backgrounds of immigrants and the citizens of and the residents of Toronto and elsewhere across the country. And it's in that sense, equity agenda then becomes a way to, do, to be seen as doing the right thing, to be seen as having the right optics. And, and it's also that sense that if we, only, if we have a couple of people sprinkled <coughs> within the leadership rank, you know, be they women, racialized persons, and so forth, so forth, we've done equity. Um, and it's in that result that to me, I think racialized workers, uh, women, indigenous workers, end up having to compete. Either they settle for the crumbs and, and end up staying in the sandbox, the space that's prescribed by the dominant, or we compete with each other for that limited space. And so in, in that sense, it's, it's putting it forward in that you know, equity, solidarity, and justice. To me, equity is the glue of the labor movements that would build the solidarity. Unless the left and all of us in this room and beyond can recognize that, that race and gender and all the other isms are not added on, um, that it's intricately, intricately linked we are always going to have an, an incomplete social movement and anti-capitalist movement. So I think that part of that sense comes from um, when we sing, you know, solidarity forever. Is it truly forever and is it truly for all? And why, when, just because workers lose their jobs, do they lose, also have to lose their unions? Right? And we keep hearing from racialized members and women members, it's, why am I being left behind? Why can't the leadership see beyond my color and hear, be, hear me beyond my accent? Or why am I being tri treated as a one-trick pony? and equity for me. I'm sharing this type of questions and comments because of both on a personal level a profound disappointment and in the labor movement, but at the, at the same time recognizing the potential of the possibility of building a much deeper, a much stronger interracial working class movement. And so in that sense, to me, equity becomes part of the fight for social justice, and it becomes part of the social transformation project that we need to have the courage and the leadership, both as courage as members to challenge the leadership and also asking the leadership at times to step aside, step back, and, and take on the issues. Um, I think in that sense, um, the other piece, I just the other two pieces, I just want to make comments on. Is so the first is on beyond the intersectionality, and how do we create that much more deeper organizing that's based on race, gender, and class, without having recognized and and at the same time recognizing they are not inseparable. And I think the other piece, part of the challenge is, if we take a look at how much, how much attention that is given from the organizers to workers who are potential union members, the dedications, the constant contact, a lot of times once these workers become unionized, become union members, all of a sudden this whole group of workers are moved forward and transferred to 
a group of experts that's going to carry on the collective bargaining and the, the institutionalizing. And to me, I think what we, it's what has been missing is the intensity that get that got extended that, that can be extended beyond the organizing. How can we harness that intensity and the activism during the organizing drive and extend it into continuous mobilizing and continuous bargaining in the workplace? And to me, I think this is where we missed the opportunity. And over the past 50 years, 60 years, um, with the legislative model of collective bargaining, you know, the bipartite, the tripartite mediation process, we have we have conceded and we have step, retreated from that space of mobilizing and relied too much on the legislative model. And I think it's time that we, so in that sense, yes, maybe we have done well in the bargaining, the collective <coughs> bargaining, moving people's wages to a more middle class lifestyle. And, but through that process, at the expense of the working class consciousness, we have not in integrated the working class history, the struggles from the past, and people are coming in, particularly in the public sector, assuming that's the norm and the practice. And so that, that in that sense, I think we have both institutionalized and bureaucratized our labor movement. And to me, I think that's, in the long term, this is to our detriment. And if we take a look at some of the examples right now in the global self, you know, be it the dock workers in Hong Kong, the Cambodian workers, uh, the garment workers in Cambodia. Yes, people are risking their lives, but they are doing whatever they can, standing up using the limited resources they have. And to me, I think we need to get, we harness, how do we, we ignite that sense of, and that fire in our belly to make sure that the mo movement would continue. And here I just want to, I think that one of the examples, uh, Steve earlier talked about the fast food workers, uh, restaurant workers organizing in the States. The other example that I want to just put forward and share with you guys, and you probably are quite familiar, is the Chicago Teachers Unions organizing and mobilizing. Uh, they went on a strike in September 2012 for nine days and to stop some of the school closing. And with the new leadership of Karen Lewis, I mean, I, I, I want to share one of her quotes. Um, it's moving away the traditional model of leadership and trying to build the rank and file activism from the ground up in the education sector and getting, encouraging all the stewards or the teachers reps going into the community, working with parents on issues that matters to the parents and the community and not just saving their own jobs. And to me, I think that's, that's the other piece. It's, um, and I have a quote from Karen here, it's saying, it all comes down to how you teach people to fight with the tools they have. We've been fighting with the boss's tools. We can spend a lot of time doing legislation. I think that's fine, have a legislative approach, but understand that you can't control that process. You need to have good relationship with legislators. You need to have members to get in touch with them and let them know what's important to them and to you. That's one tool, but it's not the only tool. Our best tool is our ability to put 20,000 people in the street. I don't care if one rich guy buys up all the ad space. The tool that we have is a mass movement. We have the pressure of mass movement and organizing. And to me, I think what's inspiring is the courage and the political will of the leadership <coughs> and the membership to take that risk to reach out to the community and say, let's flip this over and see what it will take us. Last but not the least, I think my, my last point here is um, in recognizing the new norm of precarious work, contract work, temp work in the workplaces. Um, how do we reach out and do organizing? 
beyond the traditional workplace setting. And I think it's important to build and recognize there's a repertoire of practice that can reach out to the marginalized workers, be they in the informal sector, be they are agency workers or day laborers. Uh, there's a great study that's done by a Korean uh, scholar called, his name is Dip Kwat Chung. Yeah, it's 2012 study. And he did the, he, he did four case studies on the organizing efforts of workers in four Asian countries. Uh, Cambodia, South Korea, Thailand, and Vietnam. And I think this is where it becomes really engaging and interesting to, for us to, to, be, to have the humility in saying, we don't know it all, we can't go out and teach, but we have, there's so much that we can learn from the others. And in that sense, it's the anchoring is shifting from union organizing and as the, at the traditional workplace as a site of growth into a community where precarious and marginalized workers, regardless of status, regardless of all workplace, can come together and unionize and come together as a united force to be reckoned with. And to me, I think those are new ideas, those are ideas for our organized labor, for labor movement, for our progressive left to look at, to study, and to engage in deeper conversations. Um, last, I guess, I just want, last but not the least, I think it's as moving forward, it's you know, quoting from Stuart Hall, who just recently passed away, is saying the challenge is how do we, it's not using one ideology to replace the other, is how do we keep talking to our union members, how do we keep renovate, uh, innovating and renovating and making critical of existing activities. And to me, those are part of that challenge that we need to take on. Thank you. Thank you.